Good evening, and happy Halloween, everyone. I'm your host, the decrepit yet dazzling skeleton of Evan Claymar, and in the spirit of the spooky season, I'm back at this desk for another Halloween special episode of Sounds of the Valley. Last year, in a segment lovingly titled Evan's Spooky Mystery Hour, I took you all on a journey through the life, death, and resurrection of psychedelic rock. This time, however, I'm here to deep dive into a music genre possibly even more thrilling and spine-chilling than the last. That's why I'm officially presenting Evan's Spookier Mysterier Hour, where I'll tell y'all about the history of the real spookiest, scariest music genre of all time, horrorcore hip-hop, also known as murder rap. Let's dive in. After there had been a nightmare on my street. Now, before we can try to place when horrorcore as a genre started, we first have to take care of the much more pressing question of what horrorcore as a genre even is. Subgenres of hip-hop, compared to those of something like rock, jazz, electronic, or country, tend to be a lot more loosely defined, and the boundaries between genre labels and hip-hop are more like traffic cones than concrete barriers. They get weaved between, moved, and knocked over all the time. Generally though, the thing that sets horrorcore apart from the rest of hip-hop at large is thematic darkness, and both the sound and the lyrical content. Horrorcore tracks typically involve storytelling, and their lyrics often include supernatural or occult imagery, as well as extreme, exaggerated violence inspired by 80s slasher films. The first major hip-hop song to reference the supernatural in this way was A Nightmare on My Street, released in 1988 by none other than the Fresh Prince himself, Will Smith, along with DJ Jazzy Jeff. The song sees the Fresh Prince a, describe a harrowing encounter he had with Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, which, after the song released, led to his record label getting sued by New Line Cinema for copyright infringement. In the resulting legal battle, the label was forced to destroy the original copy of the music video produced for the song. This would have been a major hit for, to the horrorcore genre if it weren't for the fact that it, it really isn't a horrorcore song at all. Despite its horror movie inspiration, the song's tone is upbeat and kinda cheesy, true to the Fresh Prince's style. The genre's signature darkness was still a few years away, but we would get closer to it in the late 80s with the rise of gangster rap. Groups like N.W.A., Public Enemy, and Cypress Hill reached unseen heights of popularity and controversy for their gritty and violent lyrics reflecting the harsh reality of life in street gangs. The explosion of gangster rap onto the scene is what first propelled hip-hop into the mainstream, and it caused the genre to be inextricably linked in the public eye to extreme violence for decades to come. But that's neither here nor there. What's important is that as we move from the 80s to the 90s, hip-hop is dark and violent now and there are some upcoming artists who are interested in pushing that boundary farther into the realm of horrorcore. Let's meet them now. Our first major player here as horrorcore really got going had actually been around for a while already. Houston group The Ghetto Boys formed in 1986, but wouldn't hit their stride until the 90s when their original lineup of respectfully nobodies was switched around to include rappers Scarface and Willie D. With this lineup, they released the first song that can inarguably be called horrorcore, Assassins. In terms of production, Assassins resembles a typical gangster rap song of the time, but lyrically, it tells a story from the perspective of an egotistical serial killer bragging about his run of victims, with the imagery in the verses being much more visceral and disturbing than any you'd find in your typical Ice Cube track. Assassins and its associated album received very little attention at the time, but the Ghetto Boys continued to release albums throughout the early 90s with similarly dark and transgressive lyrics, which gained them a great deal of notoriety, yes, but thanks in part to Scarface's stellar rapping ability, also critical acclaim. Another important group to come out of this era was 3-6 Mafia, founded in Memphis by rappers DJ Paul, Lord Infamous, and Juicy J. In 1995, 3-6 dropped their debut album, Mystic Styles, which set a, sent a shockwave through the underground hip-hop scene nationwide. Thanks to not only the dark lyricism, but also DJ Paul's foreboding production featuring low droning synths and reverb drenched drums, Mystic Styles set the precedent for what a horrorcore project should sound like. It also happened to be a major contributor to the foundation of trap music, another hip hop subgenre that, that would later become the signature sound of Atlanta, and even later become so inescapable that you can hear its influence in modern pop and even country songs. But as unsettling as country songs with trap drums are, that's a spooky story for another day. Back to the matter at hand, 3-6 Mafia and Mystic Styles sent a wave through underground hip-hop which was soon to bring horrorcore to heights it had never seen before. 
possess my evil spirits, voices from the dead. I come forth with grave diggers in a head. At this point, we move away from Memphis and to New York a few years earlier, where four guys were each caught in their own separate struggles against the cutthroat New York record industry. Producer Prince Paul and rapper Fruquan had recently been dropped by their label after their previous group, Stetsasonic, dissolved. Rapper Poetic was left homeless after his record deal fell through just before his first album released, and rapper producer Riza was struggling to find any label who would put him on at all. One day, Prince Paul invited the three rappers to his house to listen to some instrumentals he had made. Riza noticed the shared struggle that all four of them had had with the record industry and proposed that they form a group to channel their frustration and vitriol toward the, industry of mu toward the music industry. The name of the group would be Gravediggers and each of the members would take on a horror and death themed persona. Riza would become the Riza Rector, Fruquan would become the Gatekeeper, Poetic would become the Grim Reaper, and Prince Paul would become the Undertaker, not to be confused with the wrestler. With this idea in hand, they recorded a demo together called The House That Hatred Built and triumphantly shipped it to two record labels who both passed on them. Uh, with that rejection, the group decided the idea was a failure and went their separate ways. Prince Paul continued to, continued to do independent production work, Fruquan got a job making clothes, and Poetic succumbed to a fate worse than death, working at a bagel factory. RZA stayed the most busy after the rejection, though. He formed another group, and their first album was a smash success. The group was called the Wu-Tang Clan. Maybe you've heard of it? Each of them, though, had essentially given up on the Gravedigger's dream. However, a few years later, the four were contacted by G Street Records, who offered them a contract. And just like that, the Gatekeeper, Grim Reaper, Undertaker, and Rizza Rector were back in business. And after some time in the studio, they released their first album, Six Feet Deep. The album combined the hate, their hateful, vitriolic lyricism that had been established in their demo tape with ominous production marked by strings, organs, and samples from horror movies into a seminal horrorcore album commonly cited by modern horrorcore artists as one of the greatest and most significant horrorcore projects of all time. The group went on to release their second album, The Pick, The Sickle, and The Shovel, in 1997, which was critically praised for even more eerie and multi-layered production from Prince Paul. After the album released, however, Riza and Prince Paul left the group. For the next several years, Fruquan and Poetic worked together to create one last album for the Gravedigger's name. However, it was cut short in 2001 when Poetic tragically died from colon cancer. With that, the Gravediggers as a group were officially no more. But all was not lost for the album. Over the next year, it was finished by house producers at G Street Records and finally re released in 2002 as Nightmare in A Minor. It sold poorly and received mixed reviews. A dismal end for one of the most prominent names in the history of horrorcore. With the genre's immediate future left unclear, it's time we turn our sights to the other side of the music. What did the public think at the time of horrorcore? Surely only good things, right? We wonder why this society is so messed up. Listen to the music. No new genre of music, especially not one as deliberately transgressive as horrorcore, can last very long without facing public scrutiny. It happened to jazz, it happened to rock and roll, it happened to metal, and it happened to hip hop as a whole. Naturally, it was time for it to happen to horrorcore. In the early 90s, as the Ghetto Boys were experiencing their time in the limelight, their over-the-top violent lyrics really stoked the flames of the mass media, who were already in the midst of a heated discussion about the supposed link between rap music and violence. The Ghetto Boys were kicked by several labels who refused to distribute their music. Record stores pulled their albums from the shelves, and some even denounced their music as satanic. History really does repeat itself, huh? It was a veritable moral panic. However, over time, the scrutiny against them faded out of the public eye as the press turned to new and scarier things to clutch its pearls about. After all, there was about to be a nationwide debate about violent video games, and no news station would want to waste time on anything else. For, unfortunately, this brief moral panic wouldn't be the only controversy to befall horrorcore, and this next one wouldn't even stay contained with the, within the music. Alas, I've avoided it for long enough, but it's finally time for me to talk about the insane clown posse. Possibly the most broadly known horrorcore group, Detroit duo The Insane Clown Posse, consisting of rappers Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope, are widely known for their hyper-violent lyrical content and fascination with dark carnival imagery. However, arguably the most significant reason they're known is because of their core fan base, the Juggalos. For the most part, 
Jugglos can be compared to any other artist's hardcore fan base that listen to the music, wear the merch, and have a kind of insular culture with signs and calls and inside jokes. Where they div diverge from an average fan base, however, is the fact that Juggalos are classified by both the FBI and U.S. Department of Justice as a street gang. Seriously. According to an official report published in 2011 by the National Gang Intelligence Center, an estimated 10 to 15 percent of self-described Juggalos are classified as criminal Juggalos, who regularly participate in gang activity, including extortion, robbery, drive-by shootings, arson, and several other crimes which I won't get into right now and instead just recommend you go read the Juggalo Gangs article on Wikipedia. Suffice to say, horrorcore as a genre has received some modicum of backlash from the public and also the FBI, I guess. Back to the music, after the break of course. B5. Well, I got a 7, so plus 2. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah, we should probably read the directions next Bro, time. Probably. You know what does make sense? Game Show. Hi, I'm Abe. And I'm Somerset. We're the host of Game Show. If you want to see us play more games like this, or Jeopardy, or The Price is Right, check us out on mytv10.uwec.edu. And if you ever want to be in one of our episodes, make sure to scan the QR code somewhere on the screen. The 2000s saw major advances in hip-hop production technology. Where the previous generations of producers were using turntables and physical samplers, the new generation had access to digital audio workstations. I'm talking FL Studio. I'm talking Ableton. The future is now, old man. Jay Dilla just recorded a whole beat tape from his hospital bed, and it might be the best beat tape of all time. With the production technology available to make beats more layered and sonically rich than ever before, Horrorcore saw a major shift in its ethos. Where in the 90s, Horrorcore emphasized its lyrics and storytelling, with dark production being optional, the objective of Horrorcore in the 2000s and 2010s shifted to trying to create the darkest, most disturbing soundscape possible. Notable attempts at this include Goblin by Tyler the Creator and Earl by Earl Sweatshirt. However, the most prominent Horrorcore group of the 2010s, and the one that subscribed the most to this updated ideology, was Clipping. From to 2010, by rapper and actor David Diggs and producers William Hudson and Jonathan Snipes. Clipping's style of production is marked by harsh noises like drones and scrapes, heavy audio distortion, and eclectic samples, often from horror movies or outdoor field recordings. Notably, the outro for their 2019 album, There Existed an Addiction to Blood, is just an 18-minute recording of a piano burning, creatively titled, uh, Piano Burning. Fun stuff. Other artists of the late 2010s interestingly took inspiration from metal in pursuit of a menacing soundscape. For example, New York duo City Morgue incorporates compressed thrash metal drums into their beats, and Zambian Canadian rapper Backwash adopted a vocal style combining her normal rapping voice with death metal growling. As time goes on, the influences on horrorcore are only expanding, and I'm sure you all, you're all just as excited as I am to see what terrifying incarnation it develops into next. So now, the lecture part is over, and all that's left is for me to recommend to you my favorite music that Horrorcore has to offer. First, Mystic Styles by 3-6 Mafia is absolutely essential. If you're going to start anywhere, start here. For more 90s classic Horrorcore, check out Six Feet Deep and the Pick the Sickle and the Shovel by Gravediggers, and also the Ghetto Boys self-titled album. For good modern Horrorcore, check out Earl by Earl Sweatshirt, There Existed an Addiction to Blood and Visions of Bodies Being Burned by Clipping, and I Lie Here Buried with My Rings and My Dresses by Backwash. But with that said, that's about it for this Halloween. Thanks to everyone for tuning into this special episode of Sounds of the Valley. You can check out our other shows at mytv10.uwec.edu or on our YouTube channel at uwectv10. I've been your host, the decrepit yet dazzling skeleton of Evan Claymar, with these parting words. May your dreams be sweet and your nightmares be spooky, spooky monster scary and not grandma died scary. Good night, y'all.